My name is Lillian, and I like to say that I am paranoid by profession. So I'm a tech nerd, but my job really is to think about how can this new and fancy and exciting technology be exploited? What can it lead to in terms of risk, and how do we need to plan ahead to make sure that technology doesn't harm people? So we're going to talk about um, artificial intelligence and cyber risk. And maybe this is the image you have when you think about dangerous artificial intelligence. Uh, but let's start talking about what, in fact, is artificial intelligence. Now, it's not one set definition. The definition of artificial intelligence changes over time. It is, at any point, what we consider to be highly complex, human-like behavior uh, that is very hard for a machine to mimic. So it used to be the case that we thought that playing chess, if a machine could only play chess, now chess is a highly complex game, something people are good at, some, a few people, but very hard for machines to do. Now, has a machine beaten the chess grandmaster? Several times, in fact. The first time back in 1997, so more than 20 years ago, although to some controversy. Now, at this point in time, we have specialized machines uh, that have been programmed and created to play chess, and then we have machines that haven't. And in just four hours, using artificial intelligence techniques, we can train that machine to beat the specialized one. So, pretty impressive. So what is it now, at this point in time, that we consider to be true artificial intelligence? When we talk about artificial intelligence now, we talk about systems that are able to sense their surroundings, which means that they need to have sensors, they need to be able to receive input from their surroundings, being it physical or information. And they need to be able to interpret that input that they receive from their surroundings. So they need to be able to set it into some kind of context and try to figure out what, in fact, is this. What did I just sense? And based on that, they need to be able to take actions, make decisions, and also observe the outcome of their decisions and learn, continue to learn. So artificial intelligence systems, it's not just teach them once, it's teach them and continue to develop. Consider the example of a self-driving car. Now, you wouldn't place a car on the road to drive on its very own without it having received some training beforehand. So before you even try to do this, you need to teach the car what is a road, how wide is it, what are those white lines that I need to stay within, what's the center line, I need to stay on the right side of the road, and it also needs to be able to recognize things in its surroundings. So even before you try to drive a self-driving car on the road, it needs to be able to recognize hindrances, needs to be able to recognize people, make a difference between people and animals, and use that as a basis for its decision-making. Now, if I want to try to explain to you the difference between traditional programming and artificial intelligence. At this moment in time, artificial intelligence is based on the techniques of machine learning. It's not the same, but machine learning lies behind what we call artificial, artificial intelligence nowadays. So I consider us wanting to try to teach a machine to recognize a cat, a cute cat. So if you want to do it a traditional way and program the machine, then you would try to create an algorithm. So you would say, for instance, now a cat has four legs, two ears, a nose, whiskers, a tail, and it's kind of fluffy and furry all over. That's a cat. If you wanted to use machine learning, your approach would be taking a set of pictures of cats, maybe like millions of pictures of cats, giving it to the machine, not giving any other instructions rather than just telling it, now I gave you a couple of millions instances of something that has similarities. Find those similarities. And the machine would sort through it, try to find common commonalities and features, and from that create its own algorithm. And then when machine presents the algorithm to you, you would say, okay, that looks good. You now are very much able to classify cat pictures. Let's call it a cat, what you have discovered. And it's important to understand, to understand artificial intelligence at this moment in time, that we base it on that technology. Now, when you train machines to be like human, and you train it on historical data, because that's what we do, to create a machine that should be able to act like a human being, we start out by feeding it tons of data about how humans has performed that task before. So some people will say, if you want to take the bias out, 
we bring the machines in because machines are strictly logical, which is true in essence. But when you give it data and tell it to learn from historical data based on what people have done before, do you then end up with an unbiased machine? No, because people aren't unbiased. And the machine will learn from what people have done before, and even in some cases, enforce those biases. And that is one of the key risks of using artificial intelligence. I'm going to start out by showing you an example. Now, this is a kind of infamous example. So robots are biased because people are. Three years ago, Microsoft put online their very own Twitter bot. And now, her name was Ty. And she was set up, she was trained based on tweets from very positive, eager teenage girls. So Ty was supposed to be 16 years old and she was like, hello world, here I'm super excited. And now Ty wasn't just uh, learning once, she had been trained and then she was supposed to continue to develop and becoming even better on being an eager, positive teenager by all the tweets other Twitter users would feed to her. Unfortunately, Ty ended up having a rather brief online life, 20 hours, I believe, before <laughs> this happened. In the beginning, <laughs> super excited. <laughs> After 20 hours, <laughs> and there's a lesson to be learned from this. Because in machine learning, you have two main approaches, and it's called supervised, and unsupervised, and clearly Ty was unsupervised. When you do supervised machine learning, it's kind of like the machine having parents. So the machine learns from every input it gets and then presents it to someone who kind of gives corrections. And then, yeah, everyone's doing that, but maybe not such a good idea. Ty could have used a digital parent, and she didn't have that. Another example, <coughs> even if machines uh, pick up biases from people, uh, machines don't get hungry, they don't get tired, they go, don't get impatient, so there's that. Now, trying to take advantage of that, in the US they created a system that they still use called Compass, because researchers had figured out that uh, prisoners who were up for parole, if they came before the judge early in the morning, they would have 65% chance of being granted parole. So the judge would make a risk-based assessment on whether they should be granted parole based on their behavior in prison, had they offended before, how was their support network, things like that. But it turned out that if you got to go before the judge in the morning, 65% chance of being granted parole. Closer to lunch, that likelihood uh, sunk to around 0%. Uh, right after lunch, we were back up, up at 65 and then closer to dinner, it went back down. So there was something there that maybe the machine could correct for. So they created this compass system. And now, when they created compass, they also gave it some rules. So it wasn't supposed to have any bias related to things like race. But when they, after a while, uh, took a check on compass on how it behaved, it turned out that it wasn't unbiased. Uh, even though it was supposed to disregard things like race, religion, anything like that, uh, it still had an almost twice as high likelihood of not being granted parole if you were an African-American rather than if you were a Caucasian, which would have been explicitly told not to make any difference on that. But there were still things in the data, like where people lived and their relations and things like that that indicated it. And the judge's previous decisions had been biased. And so the machine kept, kept picking up on that. So the lesson to be learned from this is that there's also very unobvious biases. There are biases we know about, and then there are the ones that we don't know about, and if we train the machines on what people have done, it will still pick up on it. It will still be there. Another thing is that we need to be able, I think this is not working anymore, you know, to teach uh, the machines the difference between right and wrong and make decisions in complex uh, situations. So MIT has created something they call their Moral Machine. It's an online survey that you can still participate in. And it presents the participants with these kinds of ethical dilemmas. So you're responsible of the self-driving car. The car is nearing a, um, a pedestrian crossing. And you need to make the decision whether you want to crash the car, probably killing everyone inside it, or if you want to run over the cats and dogs. 
Now, uh, for some reason, the car cannot stop. That's not an option. And then you are giving several similar dilemmas. So there might be uh, older people crossing the street, younger people in the car. There might be a doctor crossing the street. It might be um, a signal there, so you can tell whether they're walking on a red signal or if they're obeying the laws. Uh, and over time, more than 400 million decisions have been made by people from 200 different countries, and they have analyzed this data to see if there's any similarities. And the interesting thing is that there is a similarity when it comes to choosing to save people over animals, maybe not surprising, more people over fewer, and also to save the younger rather than the older. But other than that, and they've divided this data into the sections of the world, so Western world, Americas and Europe, uh, Eastern world, so uh, Asia and Saudi Arabia, and then also Southern world, so South America and Africa. Other than that, there are huge differences, which means that it's very hard to create a set of ethics, really a law, that every autonomous car in the world should obey to make these kind of hard decisions. So if you move on from the inherent weaknesses uh, with AI, there are also some new threats. Uh, there are also ways to exploit and use AI for malicious intent. And we're going to divide those into three. So we're going to talk about physical threats, political threats, and lastly, digital threats. When we talk about physical threats, we talk about using AI systems in the physical world and how they can be exploited. We talk about something called cyber-physical systems. So one thing that we're pretty close to being able to do is the deliver packages with autonomous vehicles. So we have a pretty good sense of the world. We know we have maps, we have addresses, it's pretty concrete. So this autonomous systems can do. Now, when you do something with machines, you also lose some of the control perspectives of the humans. So one threat is reusing those um, systems for malicious intent. One example would be in Japan, in Tokyo, in fact where the narcotics mafia has taken to drones to deliver their drugs all over the city. And the police has created their own drones, who has these like nets under them, like you think like a fishing boat, that tries to catch the other drones. <laughs> That'd be one thing. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, other things would be, think of a sniper, in fact. Uh, even today, you have advanced sniper rifles that does a lot of helping uh, but with AI, you can receive input from the environment, correct for anything really, and you need a really low-skilled individual to be able to pull that trigger. You can also have attacks removed so far in time and distance that it can have been triggered years before it actually happens. Today, you need someone to push, push that button, someone to monitor it, but with an AI system, you can trigger it today, and for the years to come, it can ob observe its surroundings, make its changes as it needs to, and then at the set time, perform its attack. And if we look to the politics of it, in any part of society, be it a group of friends, at work, or even in a more formal setting, any group of people, there are some we call influencers. Some people whose opinion matters more than others. And from a political sense of view, that's very interesting, because if you can change the opinion of that individual, then you can influence the entire group. AI can be used to analyze the chatter, the social media dialogue of these groups, and by using that, you can identify who is it in here that has the strongest voice? Who is it that anyone listens to? And how can we affect those, and by affecting those, affecting group as such, and then sway political opinion, which is what you want to achieve. We also talk about mass surveillance of groups of people, of society, on a, on a scale we haven't seen before, because we can use these techniques to analyze that data, figure out a lot about the people. And there's also something called deep faking. For a while, we've seen the ability to uh, manipulate uh, videos and images, but then we also manipulate something that already exists. Now we're able to create videos that look so real, even a machine cannot detect that it's fake. But it never happened. Never happened anywhere. Same thing with images. 
We can also use this technique to ensure that you only get the information that we want you to. Because we can track your online existence, we can block some news, and we can make sure that you only see what we want you to see. Now, finally, we have the concept of digital threats. At my place of work, I have a group of ethical hackers. So they get paid to try to break stuff. They love their job. But what they do can be automated. When you want to try to hack something, you do what we call a black box test. So you know nothing about the system to begin with. So your first thing you do is to do reconnaissance. You try to gather information. And based on all that information you gather, you make decisions, you plan your attacks. Now, this is done by highly skilled individuals, but it is possible to automate. Now, it's individuals who do the analysis and decide what to do next, and then you have machines to help you do that. But all of this can be automated, which means that we can have large-scale digital attacks on a scale we've never seen before. Another thing is denial of service attacks, which can be used to block information. You have this today, but we detect it based on known signatures. We can see that this is machine generated. So we see peaks in the load, and it's like, yeah, this is not human generated traffic, we're gonna block it. But consider things like the Norwegian tax returns. And if you look at their load balances, it's like this through the year, and then, ooh, peak. And it's not something you want to block, it's expected even. But it's also not blocked because it looks like people are using the website. With AI, we can have the machines use the website, so it gets much harder to detect. And finally, the key attack, the kind of the golden cup of attacks when it comes to AI, would be a data poisoning attack. Because AI is trained on data, and it continues to train itself based on input and data. Now, if you can poison or manipulate the initial training set, and consider the example of Tai, she was kind of subjected to a data poisoning attack, but say you have a loan application system and you want it to benefit maybe you and a few of your friends. If you could manipulate the training data initially, that could go on for years and years without anyone detecting it. And that is the real, the true problem that we need to be able to conquer when it comes to AI. How do we ensure the integrity, the trust we need to have in the data that the system teaches itself based upon? Thank you.